Dr. Lucy Raymond, who is Professor of Medical Genetics uh, here in Cambridge. She is really the leading clinical geneticist and genomic researcher of the generation, really. Um, she's really led, led the way on discovering um, new rare diagnoses and putting that into practice. And she led um, the Next Generation Children's Project, um, initiated it and led it, um, which I know is something that many of you were part of. So Lucy is going to be uh, talking to us today about the project, uh, the NGC whole genome sequencing for acute new well babies and children, and um, the experience of leading it and what we've all learned from it. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, and it, it's actually really, really special to meet the people at the other end of the tunnel. Um, we do spend an awful lot of time talking about logistics and bits of DNA and where's it gone, and, and here we are as families, and I think it really reminds us that why we're doing it, and I, I certainly have found the uh, event really um, moving uh, and emotional. I, I thought to start with, it would be very useful to just talk exciting me about um, a little bit about where and how this project happened because projects rarely emerge completely out of the blue uh, and in 2012 uh, myself and one of my good colleagues uh, Willem Oahand we were charged with setting up the rare disease biosource which was a response to the government's concern about really what was the UK doing about rare diseases and we had quite a bit of money, and we had the opportunity to sequence uh, 14,000 individuals. Uh, what we chose to do it was uh, do 13 different projects. Everybody had their own area of expertise. But what we did was what everybody bought into a, a single sequencing pipeline. Uh, and we tried to do that as automated as possible. Um, and uh, as the cost of genomes was coming down, we were able to do this. Um, uh, you know, it was big data on the first level of big data, and, and actually our task, this, is you, this was very much me and Willem, and we did an awful lot of laughing and crying and trying to sort through this. Um, but it was very successful. It set the precedent that in the health service, we can do genomes, and it's really useful. And that project published in the, one of the big journals, Nature, um, uh, in 2020, and we'd identified over 40 new genes, which meant that for these families, they got an answer that probably much too late to be useful, but it meant that we could then offer answers to other families. Um, what was also interesting is because we did whole genome, not just bits, bits of genome, we could make diagnoses that people had never made before, not the, because the technology was much better. But there were some serious drawbacks with this big project. It took ages. It took more than two years to get the sequencing done. You know, the average age of the children in the arm that I ran, which was the neurodevelopmental disorders, was about seven. Well, that's, for many people, seven years too late. Seven years banging on doors saying, what's wrong with my child? Um, and also, we were very slow in delivering the families the results. It, it took quite a long time. So as most good projects, the NGC emerged out of frustration. And so what we set up, we piloted from the back end of the biosource. We looked at saying, well, actually, can't we do better? Can we and should we be doing a diagnosis really early in people's journey? Children who are really sick in NICU or PICU. And also later on, we looked at some of the pediatric specialties. We had funding to sequence about 500 families, which is still quite a lot by um, those standards. And we chose to do what's called trio sequencing. And I'll talk to you a little bit about what trio sequencing is. But essentially, we did both parents and, and the child. What was new is that we needed to be able to do this on a teaspoonful of DNA, or, of blood. All the previous project, we had armfuls, often from adults. Whereas we had to look from these wee bands, we had to take a tiny little DNA. And what we also wanted to do was to really try and think about how we do a single pass test that will cover most of the mechanisms of disease uh, and not do lots and lots and lots of different testings. Um, and the real aim, of course, is could we improve outcome by knowing what was wrong early on? And that's early days, but that's the mission. It isn't, doesn't stop with the diagnosis, it starts with the diagnosis. But for so many, many families, they don't even get the far as the first door. So that's what we set ourselves to do. This was a logistic nightmare, as always. 
And so we chose to confine ourselves to the bits that we knew we could do. So we confined ourselves to Cambridge and, and Cambridge region. We actually cover five million, paediatric neurology, genetics. We cover a big catchment area, but we didn't want to be shipping samples from Aberdeen. You know, we, we did need to start. Um, and we didn't recruit everybody. In NICU and PICU, we took about 10 to 15 percent of people coming through the door. And who are those that we chose to do? We couldn't afford to do everybody, and actually we didn't scientifically need to do everybody, because those people who are prem and doing fine, or those who have a sniff of oxygen and then go home, we didn't need to t test those, and we didn't. And obviously those that we already had a diagnosis. To be completely frank, we didn't know what we were doing. So we weren't sure who were the ones we should be doing. So we took quite a broad brush of offered it. And there are a whole series of, you know, if the child had seizures or something additionally wrong with them. But I really need to identify this little one at the bottom, clinician's request. It rarely was that formal. It was usually a hunch. It was one of the doctors saying, oh, this baby's not right, I don't know why. And that was probably the most useful diagnostic test. You know, the people looking after your babies are hugely experienced. And they have this habit of going, mm, not quite right. And that mm, not quite right meant, yeah, we'll do a genome, see if that helps. Um, and that, that turned out to be quite a good clinical test, but it's difficult to put that in print. So why did we do trios? What are trios, parents? Well, it is true that some genetic conditions run in families, parents have it, and then children have it. But for conditions that are really severe or moderately severe, that is extremely unusual. Usually, in the paediatric population with children, parents actually don't have any problems at all, and it's just that their child has a problem. And that's because the genetic code has somehow been altered in the making of that child. Either the sperm or the egg, it happens for the first time. Occasionally, a child can have an, a condition because it's, it inherits two abnormalities, one from each parent, but again, from unaffected parents. So, if we sequence all your DNA, we're all different. Sequence all of us, we'll all look completely different. If you're interested in rare disease, you need to look for the rare changes. But just because it's rare doesn't mean it's the cause of disease. So what you can do is you can look at your dad and you can look at your mum. And you subtract anything that's in the parents from the child's genetic code. And then you have the possibility thank you, um, of honing into the very few that are unique to that your child. So in that C, there is one change in green. And that is a hugely powerful way of honing from gazillions of data to about five variants. And if you've got a rare disease, we, that doesn't mean it, that's the cause of disease, but it does mean we need to work very hard to see if it is, because the probabilities are that it's quite likely to be caused disease. So that's why we did trios. We didn't look at the parent's DNA, we just used it to subtract, to hone into the problem that was in the child. So when we started, we were a little bit cautious. You know, this is new territory. Our brief as doctors is to do no harm. And actually doing whole genome on newborn babies who are very ill, who are mega stressed as parents, was quite difficult and we needed to do it sensitively. So initially we approached people and in the first couple of years, about 45% consented. We offered it and they went, no, not, you know, 45 went, yep, yeah, straight away, I want a diagnosis and I'm ready to have that test done. About 15% no, I'm not interested. Either they didn't believe it was genetic, they didn't want it to be genetic, some were concerned about a genetic label. And actually about 40% were either a logistic nightmare because they'd gone back to their own hospitals and we couldn't get the samples or we couldn't get one of the parents, or they were just undecided and we were keen not to push people too hard. You know, you, life is stressful in NICU, I hardly need to say that to this audience. You guys have been there so many times. So, but interesting, by the time we finished the project, 85% said yes straight away. And we think that's partly because of you guys. There was a huge feedback loop of graduates from NICU and PICU who said, oh, I'm in the NGC, oh, it's worked for me. So actually there was feedback from families. So your network is really powerful and important to help with the others. But also, to be fair, I think the doctors were much more confident. The pediatricians were a bit nervous about this. This is a bit felt on new territory. 
And they realized and were seeing that it was actually clinically useful for them. So they were very keen to say, yeah, you know, this is the best we can offer you. There's nothing else. The NHS has run out of our tests. This is the only thing we can give you a go at. We can't promise you, but we'll give it a go. So it was interesting how as the uh, project evolved, people became more and more keen to be involved. We weren't really very good at it at the beginning. We said we wanted to do a rapid test. We uh, took quite a long time. We hadn't got our pipeline sorted out. We were our analysis pipeline, you know, but we incrementally, each little component we nibbled away at. Um, initially, our sequencing was done at Illumina, and, and they were actually, you know, super quick, and it was brilliant. Towards the end, they were the rate limiting step because we'd honed all our other processes. Um, and we had managed to be able to deliver in a two weeks whole genome for most of our families. So thanks to you, what have we learned? Several things. I think the really key thing that we learned from the very first paper that we've, we published was quite a salutary lesson to the doctors and to the professionals in general is that if you select, if you train spot, if you go to the end of the bed and think, oh, I think it's this gene, historically that's how we did genetics. We would go, well, I think it could be one of these sort of genes. And we would only afford to look at a few genes. And what we learned was that that was actually really limiting what we could see and understand. And similarly, um, Children in NICU are not very well, but they're not very well by a relatively limited repertoire of ways of saying that. So actually, we need to look at many, many more thousands of genes, not just four or 12. And similarly, if you didn't look at the whole gene, all the genes, you never picked up the unusual children who are a slightly unusual version of the thing that you thought it might be. So the really take home message from the first part of this project was whole genome, yes, and what we call gene agnostic. You do the lot. And that's why the trio is so useful, because we couldn't look at all the genes. We could only look at the ones that were slightly unusual. But that was quite a salutary lesson. So retrospectoscopes were brilliant, but our stethoscopes were not that good. And stethoscopes, I mean geneticists choosing which genes to look at as well. Uh, and we can all look back and go, oh, of course it was such and such as you stroke your beard or whatever. And a similar image is that actually if you only, the phenotype, that's what your children look like and behave like, is re uh, really, if you only look at the top of the iceberg, there, if you don't look at all of the genes, you'll only see the tiny wee bit at the top. So this was a really dramatic proof that gene agnostic and trio was the way that we should be going. We've now finished the project, and I say we've had funding for 500 families. We actually did 521 families. And because we were quite persuasive, 90% were trios. That's unprecedented for any other research projects. The 100,000 Genome Project, about 30, 40% were trios. And that was because of the commitment of the parents, and actually I have to say commitment of people like Helen Dolling, who made sure that we actually addressed the logistics. As you know, you've got a child who's really ill, Dad may be at home, mum may be at home, you're doing shifts, and we arrange for bloods to be done at the weekends and all sorts of wacky ways of doing it, but it really was worth it. 10% we couldn't. Uh, some people were sperm donors, some were egg donors, some were estranged. It wasn't always possible to get a trio. And yes, we could do analysis, but it wasn't quite so thorough. We couldn't, because we can't sort through all of the genes. Initially, was, we did NICU and PICU, and then but towards the end, that represented about 60%. And towards later on, the pediatricians, in particular the pediatric neurologists, said, well, why can't we have this too? We need it. And so we said yes, and in fact, they were really uh, great towards the end. They were lots of recruitment from them. And similarly, some of the genetics patients, these were children who'd already had the book thrown at them, and we still couldn't find the cause, and so they came into the study too. So... If you're at pediatric neurology and you got into the study, you had about 46% got the answer that they hadn't had before, so, which suggests that pediatric neurology are generally dealing with a lot of genetic conditions. Um, uh, but actually, NICU and PICU, a significant number of the ones that we chose had a genetic diagnosis, and these are only the genetic diagnoses we're absolutely card-carryingly sure are true. We had many families where there are new genes or stuff that we're, we're still following up. 
We also showed, on the right-hand side, we showed that more than half of them were de novo, so our idea was correct, that, that um, happening in the first time for the child is the majority. But a significant number were recessive, which meant that both parents were carriers and her child had been, been, uh, been affected. And there are some slightly more wacky uh, causes of disease as well. Um, and what we also showed was that the trios were very helpful. With some of, the, some of the mutations, we just wouldn't have picked up if we'd just only done that one child. We needed to do this subtraction analysis to show that this was the cause of disease. So we are still and all and learning very hard, and, and we were, it's a mutual process. You know, the doctors do look pretty worried. Sometimes we don't know what's going on and we need your feedback and information, but also occasionally we are imparting news that we would all either rather not want to impart, but also uh, people don't want to hear. But we've had phenomenal feedback about where has this been useful? How has it affected management? Sadly, some children don't survive neonatal care, um, but it's been quite helpful, particularly for professionals, to know that everything they've done has been right and that this was a condition that wasn't survivable. And actually, I think some of the families have found that quite helpful. If you're going to impart this terrible news, we as professionals need to be absolutely sure it's the right, correct diagnosis. Um, and um, it has, for some patients, and one hopes more and more patients, it's changed management. We've got a couple of families where we've had to introduce long-term feeding much sooner than we would have done because we know the genetic condition is specifically associated with poor feeding. So, you know, it's not the parent's fault <laughs> that your child isn't thriving. It's because the gene is having an effect, which means that the nutritional status has changed very quickly. We've put people on special diets. We've changed anti-epilepsy medication. And for some conditions, they weren't obviously going to go wrong later on, but we've introduced surveillance, which meant that things like some kidneys function is being looked at much more carefully. Uh, one of our pediatricians said, you know, thanks very much, we're not going back. This has been so useful. And I think, I, I think we know that it's been useful for you. In PICU, it's very similar. Often the PICU children are a little bit older, so some of them have missed the boat. They haven't had access to the new technology. So for some of them, it's been very useful just to be able to make a diagnosis quickly. Um, and for some, it has been very significant. Trying to distinguish di different types of epilepsy is a head injury because of an epilepsy or is a head injury due to, due to a genetic condition. And that's made a big difference. Um, and it has, again, meant that we can make a diagnosis and inform families. And also for many families, this may have implications for subsequent children and they've been able to do that and use that. So when we published it, we looked at the first cohort, we were very able to literally go from every family to say, well, how is the impact for them? How has it made a big difference or not? And these are the papers that, and I've, we've put this on as a tiny URL and people are very welcome to access that. It, it is hardcore science, so it's all a bit full of long words, but you are all part of this. And I'm really pleased to say that the next paper, which is the final summary paper of this uh, study, has just been published um, last week. So not only have we found the diagnosis for some families, you as a, you as a cohort have actually contributed to the much bigger knowledge. Um, at least four new genes have been come out of this project. And these are genes where um, other families can now have a test for that gene. That, that if, it, if it wasn't for your volunteering, we wouldn't have been, have been part of that. So just to summarize, you know, rapid turnaround is possible. It's logistically challenging, but it is possible. Um, because of the work we've done, the NHS is now really working towards providing this for everybody. At the moment, they're still using exomes, but the, which is not quite as good as using genomes. But we are encouraging them and helping them to do, do with whole genomes. And it's now being rolled out across the country. So you guys were the absolute flagship. You said this is possible and we want it. And keep saying we want it because, again, you know, the, we are, times are difficult. And unless you shout and say this is what we need, it sometimes often goes off the agenda. I, I think the really important message that we found was that actually 
how your child is in NICU is not a good predictor of which gene it's going to be, so you need to do the lot. And I think that was a really useful take-home message. And this is not a one-stop shop. We need to, if you don't find a mutation, we don't find an abnormality in the genetic code in one family, we need to keep looking because the knowledge is still progressing. So we need to create infrastructures to reanalyze and reanalyze. And we've certainly, since the project's finished, we've got some more new genes coming along. So there are lots of remaining questions. I suspect you want me to stop, you know, about where this is going. Uh, and this is the team. It was huge. Um, people, many are here. Uh, but uh, my particular thanks to Helen Donning, who did was m most of the recruiting, uh, the funding, because although we started with the biosource, we ended up with additional funding. And actually, it's you guys. You have really stimulated, you know, just to see your faces, and it's so lovely to see you coming through. As part of a different project, um, and a completely, but it's a related project, we, we wrote this book called Avery, which is about a child who has problems. And we have some spare copies, so I've, I've put 20 copies out for, you, for the families, for if you have. It was actually for a much bigger project. We did, we've surveyed children, a big 3,000 children with genetic abnormalities. But the story is really relevant, and it's particularly relevant for siblings, we found. That's the feedback we've had. It's other members in the family this affects. So thanks, your stars. Big round of applause for Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Who has one question for Lucy? I haven't got a post it note. After a research project, a question we always have is Is there anything you would have done differently? Uh, no, I know what I would like to have done, and that was mm. to roll it out nationally straight yeah. away. But there are big yeah. politics in that. Um, I think the project we did. I don't know. I mean, you're the users. What about my pediatrician colleagues? Would you? What would you have done differently? Cloned Helen. Cloned Helen. <laughs> yes. I think on that note, we can all agree. So essentially, we have just been bigger sooner, but we're getting we're getting there. Thank yeah. you. Uh, and Lucy's available afterwards to talk. So next up, we have Professor David Rowich. Uh, and David said he wanted to be introduced as a cool dude from California, <laughs> apparently, who also happens to. Uh, leads child health care and paediatrics across Cambridge uh, and is very influential across the region and is going to tell us about how the new Cambridge Children's Hospital is going to cha uh, change care for children and families affected by rare disorders. Um, David, do you have slides or not? You're going to speak. We have had a lot of technical limitations, yeah. so if it's possible just to tell us the story yeah. and paint the picture for the future, that might, that might be great. Thanks. I'll, I'll stop about 10 minutes if that's okay. Okay, great. Um, well, um, so I've been, I've been referred to as a cool dude. I don't usually call myself that, but I am from California, as you can tell from my accent. Um, I wanted to start also by you know, thanking the families for your participation in the Next Generation Children's Project, um, the Cambridge um, Children's Network. So there, there are members here who are feeding in ideas for the Cambridge Children's Hospital um, to the Cambridge Rare Disease Network, who have also provided some really important input to us in the planning of the hospital. And then could we also, if Helen is here, um, is, okay, well, we're gonna have to save our applause for Helen, because Helen really brought everyone together, and what she's shown is not only the care and attention to families in that con all important consenting process. So how did families feel comfortable in consenting for a, a kind of a test that's so complicated? <laughs> as whole genome sequencing. And I think you have to have a very patient and caring person to be able to take you through, you know, backed up by Lucy, who can then answer any question, is really one of the world's experts in genetics. Um, and so that team, I think, helped us to achieve this really remarkable consent rate and really remarkable study. It's one of the largest in the world to have whole genome sequencing trios, and we've learned a tremendous amount. So again, I just want to thank all the families for your participation. Um, and, and just maybe highlight a few things that Lucy said about impact um, and why this study has had a real transformational impact from my point of view. Now, I am from California. I, I'm a neonatologist. Um, I did have that sort of suspicion that, you know, some babies weren't quite right and we need to have another test to be able to check what was going on. Coming to Cambridge on sabbatical, I talked to Lucy and we sort of said, well, why don't we just do this study? Um, and it's a study that I've wanted to do for 10 years and I couldn't do in the United States. 
Um, and it just grew from there as something that started to show how we could um, understand the nature of problems of a baby who might be intensively ill, where there are life and death decisions, where you know, we might need to use the right medicines, and how much this test has helped. Um, and so we heard that you know, about a one in four babies in NICU, or if you're a child coming to the pediatric neurology clinic like the Cambridge um, Child Development Center, 46% diagnostic rate. Now, that is surprising. Um, most pediatricians involved in this project, and, and actually people have heard about this project in the field, are very surprised. We didn't suspect there was that much of a sort of a genetic contribution to disease, and that's why there is no going back. That's why it has transformed our approach to diagnosis, and that's why the diagnostic odyssey really should become a thing of the past, because we know the right test to use, and we do it straight away. And then we kind of solve that problem, which you know is time consuming, really stressful, and maybe we're also missing a window of opportunity for therapy. Um, what this study has done, you know, is, as Lucy said, the NHS took notice, you know, Sue Hill took notice, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care took notice, and very rapidly, based on the results from this study, they stood up a national service for exomes, and now we're, we're making further inroads uh, for genomes. We're working with industry like Illumina to help make that fast and efficient and something that can be practiced not only in Cambridge, but in other GLHs, and we're definitely committed to seeing that you know, go forward. Um, now comes the next question. Now we could say, well, well, that, that's, a, that's a big step. Um, but it also actually just starts a whole other phase of, of a sort of a journey, if you will. How do we use the diagnostic information to change therapy? You know, um, we have a few examples where knowing the genetic diagnosis means you put the child on a particular anti convulsant drug if they have epilepsy versus others, or you avoid some drugs that might make the condition worse. And we saw that happen in the study, and we've, we've made those changes. We're also entering a, a phase now where we're starting to see gene therapies come into clinical practice. So this could be for Duchenne's, for spinal muscular atrophy, for uh, severe combined immunodeficiency disorders, um, Angelman syndrome. You know, the list is starting to go on. I think now in the UK, if we're able to provide diagnoses and you know, we have lots more you know, children who are, who are needful, we hope to be able to do clinical trials to be able to offer these new therapies and give families more options. Um, and that um, you know, involves clinicians and it involves a kind of a commitment in having capacity to do much more than we currently can do in, in Cambridge. So that is part of the thinking for the Cambridge Children's Hospital, that this is going to be a hospital that will have a strong focus on genomic medicine, and we'll try to do it responsibly because what the Next Generation Children's Project has done, and why maybe Lucy said there, she wouldn't do it differently, because it really was almost perfect. <laughs> it was very careful. We really tried to understand family needs. We tried to work with clinicians who were uncomfortable um, with such a complicated test. I mean, being an MD or being a, being a doctor doesn't mean you understand genomics. It's very complicated. We had to work with multiple stakeholders to kind of, you know, support people in, in, in using these tests responsibly. Um, part of this event also is to check in with families and make sure, you know, was it the right thing? Did, did, did it, what's the psychosocial impact of, of genetics? Because we can't just sort of say, well, we've given you a diagnosis and now, you know, uh, the rest is easy. There may, there may be other issues that we want to really consider and understand further. How has this impacted families? And if there are problems or things we could do better, we're probably going to want to hear them from you. Um, the, the, the hospital um, will be unusual. Um, it will be located across the road from the Rosie Hospital. Um, so we do have a nice green, you know, un, unbuilt plot of land, um, which means that, that that's one thing that makes it kind of easy. It's across from the Rosie Hospital, so we'll be very close to NICU. Um, it will be a proper hospital with theaters and ITU and, and wards, uh, but there will also be a, an institute for research in the hospital. Now, what that means is that we'll have researchers who will actually see patients. And that sounds, might sound trivial, but it's not. It's, it really means a lot. If you're a, basic, if you're a person who works in the lab, you may never see a patient or you may never see the long-term impact of the work you're doing. But in the children's hospital, you know, you, everyone walks in the same front door, patients, clinicians, and researchers, and then the, the, the research embedded in the institute. It's going to give a, a real sense of mission and a real sense of, I think, coherence to the research and clinical impact. Um, we will be working with um, uh, you know, academics and also industry to try to make more uh, gene therapy studies or, or trials available to families. 
and um, that will be another kind of commitment. And what we found is that um, there are a lot of um, um, supporters for that effort, and uh, we're coupling the Children's Hospital with a fundraising campaign. Now, why do that for an NHS hospital? Because what happens in NHS hospitals is you plan something, it looks really good, and then there's a budget crunch, and you what's called, it's called value engineering, and all the good parts go away <laughs> because they're, they're considered to be like extras. Um, when we have fundraising, and we do have you know, major fundraising that's supported now, a genome center within the hospital, um, and the naming of the research institute, that has literally cemented our commitment to be able to provide you know, access to this new type of technology and, and, and therapy. So we are really interested in your input and we're interested in really generating a community of support for the mission of the Cambridge Children's Hospital. Um, Rosie is here, if Rosie you could stand up. Um, she's got a, a information on the Cambridge Children's Hospital in case you wanna pick up a brochure or hear more. We have really um, enjoyed um, working with communities across the east of England to kind of get input, and as I mentioned, the, the children's um, uh, network has been really instrumental in sort of understanding from families and kids, what is the hospital experience like? How can we make that more comfortable? And if you look at this brochure, you'll see things like gardens in the hospital, quiet spaces. It's had design from a behavioral architectural expert who knows that there is neurodiversity and that for many children who have behavioral issues, you know, hospitals can be very aversive and you can kind of create spaces and sort of pools within the environment that are much more comfortable. And so it's been a very sensitively designed project and we're really proud to be associated with it. Um, the last thing I'll just mention, um, we're also concerned, not beyond rare disease, we're also concerned about the mental health crisis in children. And you know, that has been made worse by COVID. Um, and we've seen an 84% rise in the rate of eating disorders. Um, and self-harm. It's really very concerning in pediatrics. Um, this hospital will have physical and mental health, and we're gonna go like one step further and fully integrate so that we're, we'll have universal rooms, teams uh, of physicians, both um, psychologists, um, psychiatrists, and pediatricians taking care of children and families. And I think what we're gonna try to do is just accept, you know, that body and mind are connected, that family and child are connected, the stresses can be addressed when we have that multidisciplinary team. And I think it's gonna help us to provide a much more supportive environment and take care of the whole child. So for all those reasons, we're super excited. Um, and now Helen is here, so can we all just acknowledge Helen for bringing us together and for all her fantastic work. closer and we're making it making it happen uh, together with all of you lot um, we did get one good question that I think we can put you on the spot here it's mm. from Arnold who I think isn't actually in the hall at the moment but he might hear it from outside he knew you were a children's doctor and he had a question for you ready ready what is medicine made of by Arnold age three mm. <laughs> what is medicine made of well um, a medicine um, will Address it. <laughs> it'll, it, it will make you feel better, ideally. <laughs> um, there are so many different kinds of medicines. But when we talk about a medicine for genetic condition, um, it might just be that we're, we're going to start to think differently about sort of fixing the gene. If it's a genetic problem, can we actually have a medicine that fixes the, literally fixes the gene so that it's sort of now indistinguishable from normal. So that, that little green G that Lo Lucy showed you would, would, would have changed to another letter, and now that genetic problem may be totally solved. So I'll make sure Arnold gets the answer. Medicine is going to make you feel better, and it might have something to do with your genes. Yeah, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll, explain I'll get, I'll get him to come back to you. If you've got a bracelet you. to explain okay, it. Okay, I'll see if I, I'll see if he can come back to you uh, with some follow-up questions. Thank you. Next up, Super excited to introduce Colin Hamilton, who's a physiotherapist at Addenbrooke's Hospital, and he has special expertise, superhero expertise, um, in supporting children and families affected um, by, might, may, might, might be just major illness that affects them at one time in their life or over a much longer period of time. And he's gonna give us some of his top tips for how physiotherapy can help children and their families affected by rare conditions. Over to you, Colin. I move around a lot. Do you want me to take this with me? 
Is that right? Look at the back. Hi guys, I'm Colin Hamilton. I'm a physio at Adam Brooks. Some of you may know me. I, I've, I've looked after a few of you. I've, I know a few of you from working with you and things like that. Um, but I'm here to talk to you about physio in rare conditions. So physiotherapy is for two reasons. Okay, one is to uh, promote participation. Okay, and I'll talk about what that is in a second. The second thing is to hopefully stop problems that stop you participating. Does that make sense? I know that sounds really stupid, but this is usually what's documented. Okay. Um, so this is the big P, participation. This is the most important thing in the world for physiotherapists. And this is your ability to do the things that you want to do. I don't care if it's building Lego, it's going for a run, it's playing tennis, it's whatever. It's, it might be going to school, it might be just chatting with your friends at the cinema. It doesn't matter. For me, and as a physiotherapist, that's the most important thing. Is that okay? So. That fits in beautifully with this, okay? And this is what all physiotherapists will work off of as like a map, basically. So this is participation, okay? This is the thing that we want to get you to being able to do, okay? And these are our ways of getting you better at it. Is there something someone wants to be able to do better? It doesn't have to be anything important. It can just be something that's important to you. Anyone? Is everyone perfect at everything? Anyone want to get better at something? Love it. Okay. Go for it. Gymnastics. Okay. I love dancing and gymnastics. I'm very... Riding a bike. Love it. Okay. So I'm going to go for gymnastics and riding a bike. Okay. So my participation is going to be gymnastics. I want to go to gymnastics club. I want to do super awesome things. Flips, jumps, that sort of thing. Yeah, so I can work at that various different ways, okay? I can practice, I can stretch off my muscles, I can get stronger, so I'm better at jumping, so I'm better at gymnastics. Does that make sense? It may be that I'm trying to do the really high bar and it's just too high, okay? So what I might do is I might change that bar so it's a slightly lower bar so I can still do super awesome gymnastics, okay? Or it may be I need to sit down, and this may not be you, but this is me when I try and do things that are too hard. I might need to sit down myself and go, Colin, you're just not good at gymnastics. Is there something else you want to do instead? Okay? And that might give me a different thing that I want to work on. Does that make sense? So I can work on it loads of different ways, but the important thing is I do something I want to do. Okay? Bike riding is a beautiful one. It's an absolute classic. It's a great one to do. It may be I need to work on my balance. It may be that I need to um, work on my leg strength so I'm better at cycling and I can work at it that way. It may be that I need to maybe my balance is never going to quite get there. So what I'm going to do is use the trike. Okay? A trike does what I want to be able to do, which is to be able to get around and go super cool places by myself and get fit and active and all those things. Okay? So it might be that I change that. Or, again, it may be Colin... <laughs> You're not going to cycle because you're really quite lazy. Have you thought about Colin being less lazy? And we can work on you and work on building up that confidence or building up the, your, your oomph to do it, and that's how we get cycling. Does that make sense? So there's lots of different ways around it. And physiotherapy has been doing this for 30 years, and it hasn't really changed. Okay, But hopefully we're getting better at it, and that's what physio does. This physio is ginormous as a profession, and trying to bring that down is really difficult. But there are some general principles. Okay, Every child is different. As a parent of three daughters, two of which are twins, you sort of think children are going to be similar and how your parenting is so important. All rubbish. Kids are all different. And that's just the way it goes. And how each child reacts is going to be different. Each family is unique. There is, I guarantee there are no two families in this world that are, are the same because that would be dull. Um, only you, the family, know what you're going through. Okay? And as a physiotherapist, I need to understand that. I need to go, okay... I know what I want to do, but what's actually more important is that maybe your aunt's poorly or the dog has broken its leg and now is just not the right time or something like that. They, every family, they're the experts in that family and how important that is. As a general rule of thumb, most people get better at practicing something. Okay? Physiotherapy is not rocket science. If you practice it and you can practice it, you'll probably get better at it. Okay, so cycling is classic, gymnastics is a classic. Those Olympic gymnastics get better because they practice gymnastics, okay? And that is part of it. More is better than less, usually. There are very few things where you can do too much physio. As long as you gradually build up, the vast majority of the time, the more you do, the better it is, 
Okay? There's, uh, there's only a couple of conditions where we found that not to be true. Fatigue is awful and is impacted in so many rare conditions and it's so difficult. And managing fatigue for yourselves and your child is so, so important and very difficult. And motivation, if you're anything like me, I like to set goals, I don't like to get there. So motivating yourself to do your exercises is incredibly difficult. Okay? General rule of thumbs in physios, those are all pretty much true. I got asked to speak about what's new and exciting. We hear about what a new exciting hospital looks like. We're talking about new exciting uh, genetic tests and all these fabulous. In the therapies and in physiotherapy, the new exciting thing that I get excited about is tech. Okay, and I'm a bit geeky, so I love a bit of tech. So these are some of the bits, and I've just picked out a few problems that young people with rare diseases have, rare disorders have, and some of the things that we're, the, the technology are coming up, which hopefully will provide a bit of support for it. So um, I don't know if anyone does chest physio as part of their regime, but a lot of people, a lot of children will have problems clearing phlegm off their chest. Um, so this is the vest, which if anyone does have a young person who's got from clearing their chest, this is one of those things that's all over YouTube videos and all this sort of stuff. It basically shakes you. And if you want to look at a fun video, you want to hear someone doing this while singing, it's fantastic. And hopefully tries to clear off the chest, clear phlegm off the chest. This is a clear way. So this is a copper cyst. This is basically something that pushes air in like a leaf blower that sucks it out like a vacuum cleaner. Um, this is NIV. So there's more in the last maybe 10, 15 years, we now have young people who can be sent home with ventilators. And the difference that makes is ginormous. And the number of children on ventilators is getting bigger and bigger and bigger which is fabulous. Mobility problems, wheelchairs, buggies, all this sort of stuff. So just uh, wheelchairs have been around for, for millennia, okay? I'm sure um, I was hearing about the one way people used to get around is in a chair on some sticks in a box, um, and that's how people got around. But wheelchairs have been around for ages as well. Um, and wheelchair technology is moving forwards as well, which is really exciting. So this is a wheelchair that can be just driven if someone can only move their chin and they can completely move around. We've got, a young, we've got a couple of young people who have just gone to university who can only move their chins, and they are now able to completely maneuver around their, their university. They're able to um, use the chin control to use their phone, which means they can text phone, ring people, they can uh, do their coursework and all this sort of stuff. From, from these amazingly supportive wheelchairs. Um, these are one of the sit-to-stand wheelchairs. These were the big thing maybe five, ten years ago. I'm really not convinced by them. Um, they're the things that people are thinking, oh, they're going to be great. We're going to be able to stand people up. They're going to interact more. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's a bit like the sit-to-stand desks. If people come across this in office life, that everyone thinks it's a great idea, but then I guarantee they're mostly in this position most of the time. So, again, <laughs> But it's new. New's always exciting. Um, I got asked specifically to talk about FES, so functional electrical stimulation. Um, and that's for people with weakness. So it's using, anyone seen Slender Tones advertised on TV? It's effectively a medical one of those. And what it is, it's an electric shock to get your muscles firing, to try and get them stronger. Um, and this I would use in a clinical uh, situation to try and build a young person's strength it can work for the right child. So a child who can do it regularly, a child who has got some control of that muscle, you will sometimes find it will build strength. And the new exciting thing is meant to be around suits that you put them in and, and then it does it all for you, a bit like Slender Tone. Um, but again, a bit like Slender Tone, I'm yet to be convinced by them, okay? Um, if anyone's ever tried to keep their child in the same amount of clothing for more than three or four years, then you'll realize how difficult it is with a growing skeleton as well as some of these suits. Um, so again, some of these new technologies, they sound great, but how, how useful they are is really difficult to say. Um, as I'm sure you've heard, encouraging children to do their physio is difficult. If any of you have physio as part of your journey, I'm sure, uh, I, couldn't, I call it constructive reminding, but really it's nagging, um, to try and get your child to do what they're meant to be doing. I've got three daughters, I can't get them to brush their teeth. So how do I mind to get them to do their physio regime? That's a difficult one. So there's new exciting ways of trying to encourage people to do their practice. So this is a robot walker, so um, it helps you practice your walking movement. It all sounds very jazzy. Horrendously expensive. Um, this is a robot arm, so I'm sure none of you play computer games, but some of you may do. Um, and you'll realize, that, and I'm sure you're aware, that kids will play hours on computer games without thinking about it. So the idea behind this is, can you build that in so it's part of their physiotherapy? So it's exciting, it's fun. It's called gamification. It's meant to make physio fun.
Um, and then this one at the end, I'm sorry about that picture, it's awful, um, is uh, like a robot and that encourages the young person to do their exercises. Okay, various ways of doing that, everyone's got their own ideas. The problem is, do they work? And this is the challenge, okay? So you guys have already done an amazing job in helping out this wonderful research project and you can see the impact that's made. Physio struggles with this. Okay, and I guarantee if any of you have physiotherapy as part of your journey and you ask the physiotherapist that you work with, can I be in part of a research project that you're doing? I'm pretty sure they won't have one for you to be part of. Okay, and that is really difficult because there is so much exciting stuff coming out. We just don't know if it works and some of it is not cheap. Okay, so physiotherapy, this is very boring list, I'm not going to read it out unless you want me to. No, that's fine. Um, so they put together a big list of, they prioritize all the problems that are in physio that we need a research answer for. Okay? And it boils down to, who, we don't know who needs physio, we don't know what physio to give them, and we don't know when to give them. Okay? These feel basic problems, but we need amazing people like you to be supporting physio research as well. I think the future's exciting. The future is green shoots, exciting little things that might come to be amazing things. But I think the reality is the future is going to be this. A lot of these technologies are very expensive. Okay? And physiotherapy and physiotherapists struggle to attract that sort of money that's needed to produce these and give these to families and make them work and things like that. Okay? So it is really difficult. Uh, yeah, that's going to go forward. But... I'd also say, I don't know if people came across this, so Orcambi is something that's used in children with CF, young people with cystic fibrosis, um, which is one of the rare diseases. Um, and the list price for that is £104,000 a year. Okay? Huge amount of money. The parents put on pressure, and by some negotiation between the NHS and the company and the pressure put on by parents, this is one of their amazing protests and things like that, they were able to get a deal between the NHS and that company to provide this thing, which in theory is amazingly expensive. This is about the same as three whole-time physios over the cost of a year. Okay? But it was the parents' pressure, it's, as you mentioned, is that if you fight for it and you put pressure on people, you're more likely to be able to get things. So, and that's where physio is at the moment, is we're struggling to make that argument that we need it. So if anyone has got physio as part of their journey, I presume you see your physio a few times a year. Okay? And that's probably about average across the country. It's really difficult, but that is what the teams are able to provide. Okay? I can see my time is almost up, which is great. Um, apologies. Yeah, no, two more seconds, is that right? I've only got two more slides left. What I would say to you as parents is realizing that the vast majority of the time you are doing the best you possibly can. Okay? You have got so much on, and as I say, physio into the mix is a challenge. Um, charities can be a great source of information and support, but I'm sure a few of you have found that all out already. Um, do Google the right to rehab if you don't think you're getting enough therapy. Then it's a campaign by the therapy groups to try and get more access to more therapy and things like that. Um, and lobby your MP. Send them an annoying letter. My MP is so peeved off with me, you would not believe. Um, if you do choose to go for some of these exciting things that you find on the internet, I've got some tips. Okay? I want you to first of all realize it's a wild west out there. It really is. We talk about choice for parents. What that really means is go give it a try. It's your money. Do what you want. That's not choice for me. That's not us putting in the effort to tell you what's going to work. Okay? And that's the problem at the moment. If you hear an extraordinary claim, make sure it's backed up by extraordinary evidence. Okay? And if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I think this Next Generation Children project probably proves that wrong. But in physiotherapy generally, and therapy generally, that's probably true. If someone's promising you the earth, it may not be true. Okay? And if you do go for one of these amazing things, have a clear understanding of what you want to achieve and in what time scale. Don't let it become this open-ended thing. Is that okay? Cool. And that's me done. So I'll stop talking. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's a great question. I would be, I, my first thing to do always is to write to my MP. Um, I would Google right to rehab as a, as a Google term. 
um, it's it's a it's a, a campaign and a pressure by um, by the the problem is what the NHS does incredibly incredibly well is save your life and that initial care and then you'll often just get left okay um, therapy is 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 actually quite cheap to do but it's easily cut by commissioners and it's not invested in. The research isn't invested in all these sort of things. So the Right to Rehab campaign is all about trying to change that and trying to make people go, I want the care for my child that is going to make a difference. And, and do look it up. And I would lobby your MP and look at who they recommend you contact. Is that right? Thank you. Oh, there's a really good MP called Chris Bryant, and he does loads of stuff in this sort of space. So do keep an eye out for him and follow him on Twitter and stuff like that. Thank you, guys. And I think our last speaker today, I'm really delighted to welcome Sarah O'Hurry, uh, who's a clinical psychologist, a very important type of person at Abbeybrook. Um, and she's going to be sharing her thoughts about how families can make time for themselves. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today, I think. Good. Hi, Sarah. I'm going to take this down. I have a very quiet voice. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I'm only going to take five minutes because I know everyone's really hungry and if I'm going to talk about looking after yourselves, then I'm going to advocate for you having a break and looking after yourselves. So I am Sarah O'Curry. I'm a clinical psychologist and when I qualified 20-something years ago, I uh, started out working in child and adolescent mental health and I also kind of found my way into Hinchingbrook Hospital where I was working with children with all kinds of different medical conditions and living with all of the medical regimes and all of the treatments and all of the physio. Um, and after about seven years of that, I decided that I wanted to really specialize and work with children with long-term conditions. So I got a job at Great Ormond Street where I pitched up in cardiology and critical care. And that's where my real interests, which are around bonding, attachment, trauma, and, and kind of systems and family coping really took off. And I think what happened was I landed in CICU and I'd always done developmental histories. You know, you, you, you must have these all the time. You, you meet a professional for the first time and they ask about your child's developmental history. And so I'd always done that and I'd been thinking that I was incorporating that into my thinking about how the family was doing and what resources they had and how they were coping. And I realized, landing in CICU, when I saw these babies who were hours old, and their mother was in a maternity unit somewhere else, um, and then the parents would arrive, and their course and journey was so uncertain, and nobody knew what the diagnosis was, what the outcome was. And so then I started to really understand why attachment and bonding are so important, and why it can be so challenging to bond with your child when their life is under threat, when you don't know if you're going to keep them, when the future looks so uncertain. And I all looked around saw all the dads, the dads who were so solid on the intensive care unit, I would then see for follow-up three months later, and they would say, I don't know what's happened to me. I've just fallen apart. And of course, I know uh, what's happened to them is that they have been really strong, and they've held it together, and they've managed all the way through the crisis. And when they finally felt safe, they went home and they could relax. And of course, all the feelings came in. So when, I, when I'm working with families, and I'm particularly interested in parent-infant interactions and, and how those early relationships then provide the building blocks for children to thrive and develop, um, I, I guess I'm really still interested in, you know, attachment is a continuous thing, right? It's not a moment in time where you fall in love with your baby. There's this big myth that that happens, and then you, you know, that's it. It's a moment, and you've, if you've missed it, you've missed it, and it's not true at all. We have this continuous developing relationship, and we as parents, because I'm also a parent, you know, provide the secure base from which your child goes away from you in ever bigger circles. So in the beginning, you hold them close, and as they get older, they move further and further away, but they keep coming back. Um, so when I was thinking about why I would talk to you at all about looking after yourselves, when I worked, um, I then moved to Adam Brooks about nine years ago, I think, um, 
and was working on the neonatal unit some of the time. And I would talk to these parents about looking after themselves, and I could see them looking at me like, I haven't got time to look after myself. Or, you know, I'm not going to leave the cot side, and why would I leave the cot side? I need to be here. And actually, th by walking alongside a lot of families, over time we developed a language together, which is really that you need to look after yourself in order to advocate for your child. And the reason for that is that when you're very stressed and distressed, when you've been through a traumatic experience, it's very hard to think, it's very hard to concentrate, it's very hard to focus, and you can't integrate information. And your body's in fight flight, and you need somehow to get to a bit calmer, not completely calm, it's not possible, but a bit calmer so that you can sift through the thoughts, so that you can make sense of what's happening and how you're responding, and you can think what to do next. So I think very much in terms of there's one particular model which was developed by a, as a consensus paper for um, a, uh, a huge number of researchers who are involved in uh, trauma. So that work, the work, the psychological work that's come, the learning that began around um, trauma came from you know, people wor working in war zones and understanding major disasters and things. Um, and the five, there are five essential elements that trauma experts would say uh, are necessary to mitigate against trauma. So I'm going to talk you through them, but I'd like you to close your eyes, please, if you don't mind closing your eyes. Now, the first one is safety. And I would like you just to picture something that makes you feel safe. And the second one is calming. And I would like you picture something or a place or a thing or a sensation that makes you feel calm. The third one is connection. So what comes into your mind when you think about connection? The fourth one is self-efficacy, which basically means something that makes you feel competent and confident. So how do you see yourself when you think self-efficacy? When do I do that? When do I feel that? And the last one is hope. So what does hope look like? OK, you can open your eyes. I'm not going to test you on that. But the reason that I wanted you to think about that is because we can't really do very much about the ups and downs that happen in our children's lives and our lives um, and the challenges. And when I think about families, you know, often the moment of diagnosis can be quite traumatic. Going into hospital can be very traumatic. Um, and as maybe you reach each milestone or your child has a setback in their health, then you can re-experience the feelings of trauma. So feelings of anxiety, of loss, of fear, uncertainty, lots of other feelings like anger. Um, yeah, lots of other feelings that we find a bit less comfortable. Um, and if, you've, if you can think about what it is that you do that bring you closer to calming, safety, connection, self-efficacy, and hope, then you can protect yourself a little bit from the trauma that you're going through. So before we finish and go for lunch, I just want to tell you another thing which came up in a conversation with us. Um, and he had a concept called the emotional credit card. So if I, I, I'm going to need audience participation, um, what are the rules around a credit card? What is a credit card? <laughs> People have a credit card, right? <laughs> Do you, nobody has a credit card? <laughs> you borrow and borrow. Okay, and can you just borrow infinitely? What happens? 
you need to pay up. You need eventually to pay up, don't you? So you have a credit card. A credit card has a limit. And eventually you need to pay it back. And so I really like this concept of an emotional credit card because as parents, we give and give and give. But eventually, we need to top up our emotional credit card. So if I can leave you with two things, it's thinking about those things that help you feel calm, safe, connected. And think about emotional credit card, whether it needs topping up. So I put these things around, and there are more, just to, for you to take home and think about a moment for yourselves so you can pay off maybe 5p of your It's Brilliant. Thank you so much, Sarah. I feel I've, I've learned something really, really useful today. Um, so I really appreciate that, and I'm sure, I'm sure we all do. Um, I think I'm ready for lunch. I don't know about everybody else, but um, I know that Lucy, David, Colin, and Sarah are still here for the rest of the event, and if you'd like to approach them and talk to them, I know they'd be happy to, to hear. And also, I wanted to introduce Claire Hughes over there, who is another professor of developmental psychology. Um, Claire is an expert on brothers and sisters. What does it mean to be a brother and sister? How do brothers and sisters get on? You're a sister there, absolutely. And I know that Claire would love to talk to anybody here who's a brother and a sister and hear what you think about things. So if you are a brother and a sister um, and you've had your lunch or you're having lunch, go and, go and find Claire and, and tell her about who you are and ask her some questions. Okay. Um, big round of applause for everyone who's taken part. And let's uh, go and have some lunch. Thank you. Okay. And Helen, is lunch is ready for everybody outside on the tables. <laughs>